Hello again. We are dis we are uh, discussing today about uh, overloaded functions and uh, recursive functions. So it's quite cold here. Uh, new year of uh, 2021, first of January, and uh, we'll be discussing about functions. Uh, probably today I'll just uh, finish up on functions if possible, and then uh, we go on to. Uh, further uh, topics in C++ or maybe maybe we'll divert a little bit uh, in the next lecture so we'll begin with overloaded functions today so these are special kind of functions which are called overloaded functions uh, so in in this particular language C++ in fact these functions can be used in other programming languages also uh, but in C++, many functions with the same name, many functions with the same name uh, can be defined. So, several functions with the same name can be defined. It's, uh, as earlier I told you that only one function can be defined as one with one name. But uh, here, with a little bit of trick, many functions with the same name can be defined. The trick is that as long as they have different signatures or different number of parameters or different type of parameters so there's names are same there may be two uh, pankaj are in my class or there are two matthews in my class but their signatures would be different so they are they, they will carry out different functions so similarly as you compare with the human functions you can say that in a programming language also several functions with the same name can be defined provided they have different signatures or they have different parameter type lists so the compiler will treat them as different functions and that is how that is why it is called function overloading you are overloading a function because the function has the same name but you are overloading with its with extra work so the, the what the compiler will do depending on their parameter type it will select the proper function to call which one to call depending on the parameter types and by examining how does it decide it examines the number of parameters type of parameters and the number of arguments in the call so how do we distinguish how the compiler distinguish it the parameter list either contain a different number of parameters so either you are in the within the function the parameter list should be different of course you will have different definitions of these different functions functions will have same name but depending on their parameter type you will have different definitions as defined in your program so the parameter list either contain a different number of parameters or there must be at least one position in their parameter list where the types are different so at least one of the type of the parameters if, even if they have same number of parameters one of the parameters will have a different type then they are treated by the compiler as a different function with the same name or it will be treated as overloaded function so the function overloading is uh, mainly used to create uh, many functions of the same name which perform similar tasks because uh, obviously you will not want to use the same name for different kind of uh, things to do maybe similar things but with a little bit of difference maybe all of them uh, will uh, compute a volume but maybe one vol one computes a volume of a cube another computes a volume as of a sphere and so on so the number of parameters will be different in both the cases in one case there will be one parameter as radius another case there will be three parameters as uh, length breadth and height so that the, the, the similar tasks both of the both of the function are calculating volume but for a different uh, objects so uh, function overloading field is generally used to create many functions of the same name which perform similar looking tasks but on different data types here are a couple of examples here like here i am calling a square of a integer number another one is square of a uh, higher position number which is a floating point number which is a double position so in both the cases i am returning x square but in one case uh, it will be integer will be returned another case double will be returned so when i say square 5 which has an integer parameter it will call this version of it calls the int version this one when i call square 5.5 since it is a floating point number and this function had integer as a parameter but another name with the same name square 
the another function defined as the double parameter. So this function will be called and it will calculate this one. Otherwise, there will be uh, wrong results if I do this with this. If I try to do square, I try to calculate 5.5 square with this function, there will be problem. It will be implicit uh, conversion and then my results will be wrong. Similarly, the, I'm finding out maximum of uh, two numbers or maximum of three numbers. In both the cases, the program will be different. If I call this function max with two parameters, then this version will be called. If I call this function max in my program with three parameters, then this function will be called. So the first line in my main program, max 510, it calls the first version, this one with two arguments. And in this one, max 6, 12, and 8, it calls the second version with three arguments. So either the type of the arguments are different, where the number of parameters are same, or number of parameters are different, or both may be different. So uh, there can be many ways of defining overloaded functions. Oh, and it is uh, very useful in a uh, lot of uh, places. It is, it is going to be quite useful and you will be uh, glad to use it. Now another way of function is uh, called a recursive function. They are very specific type of functions and usually uh, recursive function is uh, are used in very special circumstances. So we'll explain. I'll explain you in what kind of circumstances it will be used. But yes, there is a way uh, to. It's a very peculiar way, very interesting way. What is a recursive function? It is a function which calls itself. Very uh, strange thing. A function is defined is calling itself. So you, it's sort of a mind-boggling, isn't it? Counterintuitive that how can a function calls itself? Yes, it can. It is called a recursive function, but only in special circumstances. Usually in circumstances where uh, the usually it is called with such parameters, when you keep on calling and calling and the base value of the parameters are of the function is known. You will understand how. So usually it is called in uh, calculating factorials or uh, Fibonacci sequences and uh, similar applications. So, a recursive function is a function which calls itself, either directly calls itself or indirectly calls itself through another function. So, usually it is used for a recursive approach of problem solving, where you substitute a given problem with another problem of in the same form, but in such a way that the new problem is simpler than the original. So, uh, you are, so in each step of this recursion, you are reducing the complexity of the problem and ultimately you will come down to a, to a very base problem where the solution is known, like factorial. Suppose you want to fa compute factorial 5. So factorial 5 you can write as 5 into factorial 4. Then 4 you can write as 5 into 4 into factorial 4. 4 you can write fact 4 into factorial 3 and so on. And ultimately factorial 2 you will write as 2 into factorial 1. And factorial 1's value is known. You don't have to compute that. It is known. Then you put that value here and then go back and compute the whole process. So that is how the recursive functions work. So there are two important conditions which must be satisfied by any recursive function and they are the following. Each time a function calls itself, it must be nearer to a solution as I just explained you with the factorial example. You are going nearer to nearer and nearer to the solution. And there must be decision criteria for stopping the process. Like in factorial, you will say, when I reach to factorial 1, I will stop the process. I will just put the value of factorial 1 and I go back to my original thing. So, a recursive function is called to solve a problem. The function only knows how to solve the simplest cases. And in the simplest cases, it knows factorial 1 is 1. It doesn't know anything else. Or factorial 0 is 1. These things, then it knows. Otherwise, other values it does not know, it just calculates them recursively. So it only knows how to solve the simplest cases or the base cases, we call them base cases. If the problem is very complex, it is usually divided into smaller problems successively till each sub-problem is reduced to a very basic case which can easily be solved. The solution to the original problem now is to go back in time or is to go back in the execution 
then build up upward from the solutions of the basic problem then go to the next sub problem next sub problem and go on and on like see the non negative power of a number you want to calculate so i define a function double power float x on sign integer n if n is greater than 0 is equal to 0 then you return 1 i know that something to the power 0 is 1 otherwise you return x into same function power x minus x to the power n minus 1 like uh, you you know 2 to the power 3 is equal to 2 into 2 to the power 2 2 to the power 2 is same as 2 into 2 to the power 1 2 to the power 1 is same as 2 into 2 to the power 0 and when n is equal to 0 return 1 so you know this value you know now you go back to calculate the other values well explain with, with the diagram very soon uh, just be 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 uh, patient with me now the factorial pro the problem i already told you fact is if number is equal to 0 then we return 1 otherwise number is num into fact num minus 1 so factorial 5 is 5 into factorial 4 4 will be 4 into factorial 3 3 will be 4 3 into factorial 2 and so on unless you reach factorial 0 which is 1 so that has that is how it works suppose here procession of very cursive call factorial 5 which will reduce to according to that program it will reduce to 5 into factorial 4 this will be 4 into 3 factorial 3 into 2 factorial 2 into 1 factorial now this is known in the we have already defined in the program if n is equal to 1 this will return 1 when the one is returned you come here one is returned then you calculate this 2 into 1 2 is returned then 3 into 2 3 6 is returned 6 into 4 24 is returned 24 into 5 120 is returned so final value will be 120 so you are recursively you are calling function within a function and then from the base value you are recursively calculating the value of the function that is why they are called uh, recursive functions Fibonacci series again. Uh, you can, uh, if you do not know what Fibonacci series are, then you can go and uh, search the webs, uh, web space, and find what are the Fibonacci numbers or Fibonacci series. But usually, in 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 uh, general, Fibonacci n is Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci n minus two. So basically, the current number is the summation of last two numbers in the series. So that is a Fibonacci series. So it can be defined recursively. Only on only the first two uh, steps are known. Two base values are known. Others are calculated. So Fibonacci zero is zero. Fibonacci one is one, and others will be calculated by this formula. So we define this as uh, if n is equal to zero or n is equal to one, we return n. So we return either zero or one. Otherwise, return Fibonacci n minus one plus Fibonacci n minus two. So you are recursively calling the same function, which is Fibonacci, and you are calling this again and again. And that's how it will work. Now, uh, some I'll not say disadvantage, but I'll say some statements about the recursive algorithm. It can be expensive in terms of processor time and memory space. As you see, it will take a lot of time. Only thing is, uh, things are easier for the computer to do. But it will be a long process to take time, and since a recursion repeatedly calls the function, each recursive call causes another copy of the function to be able to be created. So it takes up exhausts exhausts a lot of memory is space. So each level of recursion in function Fibonacci, you need a in fact a doubling effect every time two Fibonaccis are called. So we have a doubling effect on the number of functions calls. So the number of recursive calls for computing nth Fibonacci uh, sequence is of order two to the power n, and uh, usually it just grows exponentially and it goes out of hand. So, so the, all the recursive algorithms which uh, result in these exponential increase in the number of function calls should be avoided. So usually it is not preferable. There is another way of solving the same problem through iteration. Uh, recursion also or uh, iteration iteration is uh, simpler to understand and uh, probably easier to implement also both of them are based on a control statement iteration you have already studied through for loops or while loops and uh, so on 
So those iterations also can be used for the same program. I'll give you an example very soon. So the, both of them are based on a control statement. Iteration uses a repetition structure, like a for loop or a while loop, whereas recursion uses a selection structure. You select a particular thing to given a condition. So both will involve repetition. Iteration explicitly uses a, uses a repetition structure, usually a for loop, and recursion achieves repetition through repeated function calls. Both will also have a termination test. When to stop, this will be there. Termination terminates when the loop continuation condition fails in case of iteration. In case of recursion, it terminates when the base case is recognized, when you reduce the problem to the base case. And both can end up into an infinite loop. Uh, as we know in the looping uh, lecture, I discussed what is an infinite loop. It occurs in an iteration when the loop continuation condition never becomes false. So the loop will go on forever. It's an infinite loop. Similarly, if, if your problem does not reduce to uh, during the each recursive call, then infinite recursion would occur. If you are not going to reduce it to the base case, then there will be an infinite recursion. Now, due to repeated function calls, if you are again and again calling the function, the recursion can be very expensive in terms of processing time and the memory space. Whereas iteration usually occurs within a function, so this is less expensive. It takes less memory and less execution time. So an iterative solution, in my opinion, is always preferred over a recursive one. A recursive approach to solve these problems are only chosen when this approach naturally mirrors the problem and results in a program which is easier to understand and debug. When, like in the case of Fibonacci and factorial case, it directly transfers my uh, formula into the program. So it is easier to understand and debug the program. So in the such cases, it is okay. Otherwise, one should always go to the iterative solution. And uh, whenever uh, sometimes iterative solution is not very obvious, then also a recursive approach can be taken. But usually, one should avoid them. Here are the couple of uh, ways to compute the Fibonacci number. This is the iterative way and this is the uh, yeah this is the iterative way. You, we have already seen the recursive way but this is the iterative way. In iterative way you have uh, defined the function Fibonacci for a number where you have defined f0 is 0, f1 is 1 then fib and then if this is the value then return and otherwise you go for a loop. So this is a iterative uh, process 2 to uh, n what is the number n and just you say Fibonacci f0 plus f1 then you assign them and return Fibonacci so you go on iterating this over uh, these values and each time increasing the value each time and uh, you can easily calculate that you call it in the in the main program and you can call the nth Fibonacci number so this is the way an iterative Fibonacci algorithm would work you can try both of them and see which one of them take uh, lesser time. You can try the recursive method also, you can try the iterative method also for Fibonacci number and take a very large number so that uh, you will realize the time difference between these two procedures. Now uh, the last thing I would like to discuss in the uh, for the functions will be how to pass an array to a function or uh, we, we already know how to pass but uh, just uh, some properties of passing an array to a function. Now arrays can also be passed to functions as arguments. We said values and their addresses. In fact, arrays are passed through their addresses. That's what we will see just now. So to pass an array argument to a function, what do we do? The name of the array is specified without any bracket, just like a simple variable, uh, like marks is an array, but we are not passing in within the function. There is a function called in, the, in my main program, I am calling marks sum as a function with two parameters where the first parameter is an array, but I am not putting any brackets here. Then the function call, the name of the array is specified without any bracket. So from looking at the function call, you will not be able to tell whether marks is an array or not, whether it is an int type or not, whether it is a float type or not, whether it is passed through reference or not. So with the function call, you will not be able to tell anything about the nature of parameters but ex implicitly my program knows marks is an array and in this case this array is being passed to my function 
So the prototype of the function to which the array is passed, that has an argument has this form. In the prototype or in the header of this uh, max sum, you will define that this is an array which is to be passed and there you will put these brackets there, data type, name of the array and the this, the data type int array this. The size of the array has to be passed explicitly to the function because the computer compiler does not know how to compute the size of this. For this int, it knows it, it is an int parameter, so it will reserve a 4 bytes or something, whatever, depending on your computer. But in case of array, you have to pass the size of the array because the compiler should know beforehand how much memory is to be allocated to this particular parameter. So if it is an integer one and it has 20 elements, then 20 times 4, 80 uh, bytes in the memory should be reserved for this particular parameter. So the size of the array has to be passed explicitly to the function that processes the array. Because in this language, a function is unable to compute the size of the array passed to it. So uh, the array name marks in the function called marks sum is actually the address. So what is being passed? That is how hard you to understand. I am not passing the whole array. I am just passing the reference or the address of the first element of this mark of this array. So that means I am called, I am passing the address of marks 0, which is the first element. Remember, indices always run from 0 to 19 for, a, for, a array, for an array of 20 elements. The indices will run from 0 to 19. Marks 0, marks 1, marks 2, and marks 19 up to marks 19. So the, when I am passing this array, marks 0's address will be passed to this. And after that, it just keeps on calculating depending on the type of the array, if type is int, so if it, if it takes the address of the first element, add 4 bytes to it, next element will be passed as address uh, from 4 bytes away from the original one of the original one of the first element. So to summarize, passing array to a function is similar to passing a variable by reference. The function and what is the ultimate effect because you are passing by reference. So whenever is an array is to be passed, whether you want it or not, not, the function will be able to change the values of the array elements. If it is changing the array elements within the function body, then that will also be reflected to the in the calling function. So that you have to be careful about that. Here is uh, one example of passing array to a, to a function. Suppose you have a uh, this uh, in array sum where you are summing an array, uh, 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 we are summing the array, all the sum of all the array elements it calculates. So this is an array of one dimension and uh, y is the um, number of terms in the array and so you are doing uh, from i is equal to 0 to less than y so first from the first element to the last element and sum is sum plus xi. So you are adding uh, repeatedly in an iteratively in an iterative way you are adding the uh, value of these elements to the summation and it will return a sum so here is this and you pass this array like this you input it all the array and then you say sum equals array sum a n where a is this array of uh, n values where n is being passed a to n and then the sum of the array will be calculated from this program and it will be returned to you in the uh, main program. Now similarly we can also find out maximum of array elements uh, which is the maximum of, array of uh, element uh, of uh, what is the maximum element of uh, all the array among all the array elements and this is how you, you get a comparison for all the elements in the, this is the function finding max in an int x where the number of elements are y and uh, you compare each and every element with a standard number and then you keep on changing that number and ultimately you return the maximum value. So similar way array max, max a n and remember here you have no way of uh, telling whether a is an array or not. It is simply passed as a simple variable but what is being passed? The address of a 0 that you should remember. Okay. How do we pass a 2D array? 
to a function. Now, 2D array again are similarly uh, passed and uh, within the uh, calling uh, statement, you will have no way to, telling, to tell whether it is a one dimensional array or two dimensional array or three dimensional array. Only thing is it will be defined in the prototype or the function header. So then in the prototype you say display int exams number of columns explicitly exams number of columns uh, these are in rows rows can be inserted here but now these columns have to be defined so these have to be explicitly defined the size of the first dimension of array can be omitted but of course it is omitted but it is inserted through this these are variable through the number of rows here but the second one has to be already defined in the header itself what is the reason because c++ stores a 2d array in a row order first first row will be in, stored then second row will be stored then third row will be stored and so on so the to distinguish between the rows of the array it needs to know how many rows are there otherwise it will be very difficult to it will completely get confused if you don't tell them tell it that uh, how many rows are there or, uh, so the, it will get confused so in a function call only the name of the array is used as I told you earlier here is an example how to find out some see 2d arrays I as I told you earlier also they will be mostly used to manipulate matrices so how do you find the sum of the elements of a matrix uh, so here it is defined float a suppose there is a 10 columns uh, uh, at the map at the most uh, then int x and y are number of rows and number of columns respectively you get uh, summation of all these things and then you get it back in your main program you have array 10 10 in the function header you have defined that this will be array of two dimension and there will be two more parameters which are number of rows and number of uh, columns in the program and then you call the function here sum a which is an array of two dimensional two dimensions m and n number of rows and number of columns so that is how you call and then you get the result instead of some of the elements you can have other results here also all right so we discussed today about overloaded functions and recursive functions and uh, this probably finishes up uh, most of the basic uh, stuff in c plus plus and uh, we will be uh, in the next class i will be discussing uh, probably uh, number system I'll try to uh, change the motive a little bit and uh, we'll digress from the programming to the number system because that is also one of the basic things we need to learn uh, in C++ uh, and then we'll pick up on memory management after finishing up number system we'll pick up on memory management in C++ like uh, how to do pointers and then we'll go on to struct and classes so we'll see you next time.